Okay, hey everybody. Well, we're gonna have to uh, dust off the old Dragon Ball logo for this one. Haven't seen that in a while. Also, I broke out the flannel shirt. I went back and I watched the last Dragon Ball video I made on this channel, which I believe was the Broly movie when that came out like three and a half years ago back in 2019. And I was wearing this flannel shirt. And I'm like, I like that flannel shirt. So I found it. And I guess this is just going to be whenever I'm talking about Dragon Ball in the future, I got to wear flannel for some reason, you know? It's a 90s thing. I know Dragon Ball started in the 80s, but, you know, Dragon Ball Z was in the 90s, so flannel is where it's at. Okay, so this is going to be a discussion, I guess a review, whatever you want to call it. Discussions, reviews, people get too bogged down in the terminology of these things. We're talking about anime, all right? We're going to be talking about Dragon Ball Super Hero, the movie. I saw it last night, and uh, spoilers for everything involving the movie. I thought about doing like a non-spoiler section, then a spoiler section. Okay, here's the non-spoiler section. Go watch it. It's a good movie. Okay, now everything else is going to be spoilers like crazy, all right? Now, going into this, I was actually very like kind of apprehensive about seeing this movie because I guess the marketing wasn't that great, but also like the reviews weren't that fantastic. I saw a lot of people like complaining about the movie and like I was going to go see it last night and then I sort of like changed my mind like, uh, do I really need to see it on opening day? Uh, at least the first day that my theater was showing it. Like, do I have to go see it today? I could see it like next week or something. I don't have to go see it tonight. And at the last minute I decided, you know what? All right, I'll go see it. And I did. And I kind of love it. <laughs> like, I'm going to be honest with you. I fucking love this movie. This was incredible. This movie was amazing. Like, holy shit. I, I don't know. Like, okay. Okay. I can understand why a lot of people maybe didn't like it that much. I get it. Because... Think about all the other Dragon Ball movies that have come out in the last few years ever since, like, the resurgence of the Dragon Ball franchise, okay? So we have Battle of Gods, we got Resurrection of F, uh, and we got Broly, okay? And all three of those movies are really bombastic, like, events. You know, like, Battle of Gods was literally the revival of the Dragon Ball franchise, right? It had lied dormant for 10,000 years, and then it arrived again, you know? So you got Goku, you got the introduction of Beerus and Whis, you know, like, holy shit, there's gods now, and Goku's gotta become a god to fight him. That's insane. And then Resurrection of F, you got Frieza back again, once again. First time we'd seen Frieza in a long time in the franchise, and now Frieza's got a new form, and now Goku and Vegeta both have god forms, and like, this is crazy. And now Broly, the last movie, like, we got Broly, he's back, and he's canon, and he's all muscle. You know, he's back again, he's got the legendary Super Saiyan, and then Goku and Vegeta are gonna to make Super Saiyan God Blue, Super Saiyan Gogeta, and it's like, yeah! I can understand, with that all being the setup and the buildup, with the last three Dragon Ball movies we've had that have had a major theatrical release. Dude, seriously, I get it. Going into this one, it is a major tone shift, okay? Because Goku and Vegeta are barely in this movie, okay? All told, they probably have, like, 10 minutes of scree time. Maybe you could stretch that a little bit because there's actually a post credit sequence with them that is amazing, and I want to talk about that as well. The main character of this movie, though, I shit you not, is Piccolo. Piccolo. He's back there on the poster, right there. There he is. There he is. Piccolo is the main character of this movie. And you know what? At about, like, 25, 30 minutes in when I realized that he was the main focus, I was like, this is incredible. I can't believe they're actually doing this. I can't believe that they actually had the balls the Dragon Balls, to make a full theatrical feature-length Dragon Ball movie and not have it be focused on Goku and Vegeta in the year 2022. I'm blown away by this. Now, now, this is not the first time they've tried this. The Dragon Ball franchise has a lot of movies, okay? I don't even remember what number Super is. I mean, there's like, I think there was like, just from the original Dragon Ball Z movies, there was like, you know, over 10 of them. Uh, you know, and like, Wrath of the Dragon was the last one, but there was also movies from the original Dragon Ball, like the Curse of the Blood Rubies, if you want to count those, whatever. You know, there was the one with the vampire.
Empire and the giant death cannon. I don't know. Dragon Ball is a weird franchise. But there's a crap load of movies, right? So they've tried this before. They tried this with Broly Second Coming, where Goku was barely in that movie, uh, I think until like the very end, and it was mostly like uh, Gohan and then Trunks and Videl and Go Goten that were like the main characters of that movie. But that movie sucked. And then also kind of with Bojack, where uh, Gohan was once again the main focus of that movie. So Gohan is in this. He does have a lot of screen time in Superhero, but I I'm going to say more so than Gohan, Piccolo is the main character. And then, you know, you could go Gohan as like the second main character and then beyond that, some other characters that are thrown in. But I'll tell you what, man, whoever wrote this, they, they knew these characters, all right? We have a bunch of references and Easter eggs from the old Dragon Ball days, from the old Dragon Ball Z days. There's so many references. It's almost like these characters are written um, by people that actually understand them, which is strange, you know? And so Piccolo in particular, like, I'm going to be a scattershot at his hell with this, okay? I'm going to be jumping around this film, okay? So let me just give you an idea. Like, there's a scene relatively early on where... Where Piccolo fights against an android, okay, a brand new android for this movie, Gamma Number Two, and we'll get to him and everything about those androids and the resurgence of the Red Ribbon Army. We'll get to that. But there's a scene where they're fighting, and the android's like, "So you must be King Piccolo," and he's like, "I haven't been King Piccolo for a long time, you know." But back when I was King Piccolo, that outfit of yours was sort of in style, you know. <laughs> so it's like little jokes like that. But there's references to, you know, King Piccolo, and then he's like, "Well, I'm part of the Red Ribbon Army," and then. And Piccolo's like, I remember the Red Ribbon Army back when I was Kami, because he has all of Kami's memories, because he is Kami, because they're originally the same damn Namekian. There's little little lore references sprinkled all throughout. Like, there's a scene where Videl calls Piccolo up, and is like, hey, can you pick up Pan from pre a preschool? And Piccolo's like, yeah, I can do that. And Videl's like, great, I'll make you a, a huge meal as a thank you. And Piccolo's like, I don't eat food, I just drink water. And it's like, this stuff has been a around in the Dragon Ball lore for a very, very long time. And it's been stuff that I think has, I think the idea like Namekians survive on water, I think that was mentioned like a long time ago in the manga, but it was like one of those things that was like mentioned once or twice and then just like never brought up again outside of like, you know, data books or like the most hardcore fans would like know the dietary habits of Namekians or whatever. Um, y you know, but like the movie brings it up. So it's like whoever wrote this, they did their damn homework. You know what I mean? They went into the movie, they went on the wiki or the data books or the Daizenshu or whatever, and they were like, okay, we're going to make a movie where Piccolo is front and center, so we're going to know how to write Piccolo, all right? And they write him fantastically, all right? It's just, it's so nice to finally see a side character in a Dragon Ball movie like, do anything relevant, okay? Outside of, like, maybe, like, oh, like, like, Krillin. We had a scene in this movie where Krillin shows up at the end, and Krillin, you know, throws a Destructo disc at Cell Max and saves 18, and that was nice. Like, there's some comic relief from Krillin. Dude, seriously, if you want to make the next Dragon Ball movie all about Krillin, you know, if this movie is any example, I'm gonna go see that shit, all right? Like, it's, 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 it's a great film, okay? Now, like I said, like I said, if you are waiting for Goku and Vegeta to show up in this movie and fight against Cell Max and, like, Goku and Vegeta go into their new forms, like, Goku has mastered Ultra Instinct, Vegeta goes into Ultra Ego, his new form, and it's just like they beat the shit out of Cell Max. If that's what you're waiting for, if that's what your expectation was for this movie, then, yeah, you are going to be disappointed, all right? Basically, the premise of this movie can be summarized thusly. <clears throat> the Red Ribbon Army has returned to take over the world. But oh no, Goku and Vegeta are out of town for the weekend. So it's up to Piccolo and the B Squad to save the day. You know, that is basically the premise of this movie. But the way the characters were written, make it work. I think the comedy was on point. I saw some people saying, because I tweeted about this last night, like I'm going to go see Dragon Ball Super tonight. Some people were tweeting out that like, ah oh, man, like the comedy was kind of hit or miss. Dude, like, there were a few of the jokes that didn't land, but for the to be honest with you, for most of the part of this movie, I was laughing along with everybody. A lot of the humor is like 
sight humor. Like, like, okay, there's a new character named Carmine, who, or Carmine, whatever. He's like the butler or the chauffeur for the new leader of the Red Ribbon Army, uh, Magenta, who is uh, Commander Red's son. All right, so we're going to get into the back lore and the Red Ribbon Army in a second here. But basically, there's this new character named Carmine, and he, like, has this big pompadour haircut. It's like a very, uh, like, very crazy anime kind of haircut. His car literally has, like, a bubble built over the driver's seat, so he his, his hairstyle can fit. Little things like that. He has, The car has like a little thing that dispenses Oreos. So Magenta is talking to Dr. Hedo, who is the grandson of Dr. Jiro in the backseat trying to like, hey, you should come work for us. We're going to bring back the Red Ribbon Army and you should build some androids for us and a brand new cell and everything like that. And it's like while this whole, um, this, uh, you know, uh, d discussion's going on where he's trying to persuade Dr. Hedo to go over to their side, he has like this little little compartment that just like there's like oreos and then like they run out of oreos and he presses a button and it just reloads the oreos and it's like i don't know like little things like that it's just very kind of like old school dragon ball with like the sight humor and stuff um dr hedo has like this interesting like like hero suit that he wears and he pushes a button and it's like the glove transforms into like a screen which it, it, the whole movie is animated in this very 3D CG kind of style, but it really works. Seriously, like, I, I really honestly wasn't worried about the animation style because there were like some other anime movies I've seen in that 3D, and it worked great. There was a Gantz movie that they did. I can't remember what it was called. It was a Gantz RE something or whatever. But there was a Gantz movie where it was animated in that 3D style, the Osaka arc, and I love that movie. That's probably like my favorite Gantz movie like ever. That's not much of a standard here because there's some other live actions and that's it but i like that 3d kind of style all right so i think in the dragon ball universe it fits perfectly fine and just adds a whole other layer to it um i thought i was going to be like sitting down watching like oh man this is going to be like i'm watching like somebody play like uh, a dragon ball video game like tenkaichi budokai or something on like the playstation 2 but no no the animation is so good it is really solid and it adds like they really play with the 3d angle of it you know a character will fire an energy blast but then the camera will zoom out to see the full scale of this energy blast or whatever. It's pretty neat. Okay. So, like, the, the humor was on point for me, the animation was on point for me, the characters were on point for me. Now, there, there are still, still some things to nitpick about, and there are things about the movie I did not like. Um, but overall, this movie was a blast. It was like a breath of fresh air that, like, yeah, not every single Dragon Ball movie has to be like world ending events with like Goku and Vegeta getting a new form and beating the crap out of a new enemy like th this can be something else you can have a movie based off of side characters and it can work okay and honestly like th this is going to sound so weird this is going to sound like an oxymoron coming out of my mouth but just because you have a main character of a series doesn't mean they need to be front and center in every single form of media in their franchise now, that's going to sound a little weird because it's like, well, they're the main character teching. Obviously, they need to be front and center because they're the main character. I get it. Goku is the main character of Dragon Ball, but it's okay to have a movie every once in a while where it's not all about Goku. And like I said, they tried that before with uh, Broly Second Coming, and they tried that with BoJack Unbound, and uh, it just it didn't work with those movies because those movies just weren't that good. <laughs> they just weren't that good, but it wasn't the problem that they were focusing on other characters, the movie themselves. I don't think... I think Bojack Unbound would have been that great, that much better if Goku was part of it for more. Or if, oh, if, if Goku was the main character of Broly Second Coming, that would have instantly made Broly Second Coming so amazing. That wasn't the problem with the movie. It was just the way those movies were written were just shit, okay? So, um, yeah, like, uh, like in One Piece, for example, I love Luffy, but, you know, if they wanted to make a movie like One Piece, film law, I would watch the shit out of that. I don't know, some other popular side character in the One piece where like Rayleigh one piece film silver I would watch the crap out of that you know we're kind of doing that right now with film red and shanks you know and right so um yeah let's just get into the plot of the movie now I'm gonna try to go through the plot beat by beat as well as I remember and just talk about it as I go okay 
So, the movie starts off with the Red Ribbon Army, okay? We get a whole recap of the Red Ribbon Army, in case you forgot who they were. It was a long time ago. Um, we see updated animations in the 3D style of, uh, well, no, it's, it's kind of 3D, some of it's 2D, but it looks really good. And it's going back to the original Dragon Ball style, so we see little kid Goku fighting his way through Muscle Tower, fighting against Lieutenant Blue, fighting against, um, you know, the, the Red Ribbon Army base and taking out uh, Commander Red and all that. Well, I guess he doesn't take out Commander Red. Red, but you know what I mean? Like the whole like scene there where he fights against Staff Officer Black and the robot and everything when he fights against uh, Mercenary Tao and everything. Like we see those scenes updated with modern animation, but it's still in the Dragon Ball style. And then we cut to, you know, Dr. Jiro and the androids from Dragon Ball Z, and then the animation style shifts. So it's, it's updated. It looks very crisp. It looks very clean for 2022, but the style is very different because they paid attention to detail with this, okay? Because if you look at the animation style from Dragon Ball uh, during, like, the first arc of the story, and then the animation from Dragon Ball Z, like, during the Cell arc, obviously it's just very different, okay? And so it's, it's maybe a little bit more cartoony, uh, because it's, it originally kind of started with like as like a gag manga at the very beginning. So, you know, it, it sort of, you know, keeps to that style and that tone with the Dragon Ball flashbacks. And then with the Dragon Ball Z flashbacks, it's a little bit more of a serious kind of animation style. That's the best way I can put it. So, the Red Ribbon Army, Commander Red had a son named Magenta, okay? And he continued the Red Ribbon Army in secret by starting the Red Pharmaceutical Company... Which, by the way, has the exact same logo and everything as the Red Ribbon Army does. This is the first little nitpick of the movie, but honestly, I don't even know if it is. Because I think it is so over the top with it, I think it was meant to be a joke. You know what I mean? Because the idea is the Red Ribbon Army was like this paramilitary organization that literally wanted to take over the world. Like, that was the main goal of Commander Red, at least. Well, wait, no. Wasn't the main goal of Commander Red to collect the Dragon Balls so he could be taller? You know, but I guess ostensibly their main goal was to take over the world. Whatever. Goku shuts that shit down when he was a little kid. And then they're like, okay, this global, like, organization of, like, robots and androids and military trying to take over the world and everything like that. That was destroyed. But now there's a pharmaceutical company that has the exact same logo, pretty much the exact same name. And the CEO of said company is named Magenta. Yeah. No relation to that giant military organization that tried to take over the world. By the way, like I said, they don't even try to hide it. The Red Ribbon logo is plastered everywhere. Everywhere on their buildings, on their clothing. It's just like Magenta literally wears a pin that says Red Ribbon right there on it. It's all over the place. They have a secret hideout, which is really not all that secret because it's connected to, like, the highway. It's really, it's like a couple miles down the street from the prison where they picked up Dr. Hedo. It's just, it's just right there. So they have this cool, like, mountainside, like, secret base where you drive in, and then it transforms into, like, a secret base. Like, there's a holographic, like, shell covering it. But it doesn't even matter because there's giant logos of the Red Ribbon Army out front of it. They have a lake that's in the shape of Red Ribbon, like, the logo. And it's just, like, it's so obvious that these guys are still around. I think that's part of the joke. Like, oh, yeah, they've been around for, like, the last 20, 30 years, ever since, you know, Goku destroyed their main headquarters. But, like nobody notices or nobody cares or nobody connects the dots. I don't know. I just, I just found it funnier the longer that that went on. Anyway, so Magenta is the new boss, and they actually managed to get a lot of the, uh, the quirky things that Commander Red did with uh, Magenta. You could tell they went back and they watched the older Dragon Ball episodes and saw how, like, Commander Red acted, and they basically they kind of adapted that to how his son would be. Um, and Magenta was a pretty funny character, I liked. You know, it was very just like, I will try to take over the world, you know, but I'm an idiot, kind of, you know, so that's kind of funny, whatever. And Carmine is like his butler or his chauffeur or whatever. His funny thing is that he likes to make YouTube videos, so he's like, he's like, he's like, yes, I will show you these classified, um, classified surveillance footage of Piccolo and Gohan. And he just like uploaded them to his YouTube channel. I guess he keeps them unlisted. I don't know. I just find that guy kind of funny. That's, that's, that's very relatable to me. So I like that character. Uh, but you know, every, everything, just the comedy was pretty funny with these two. It's kind of more of just like a wacky duo because relatively early on in the movie, 
you understand that, like, okay, Magenta is not a threat. The Red Ribbon Army, even though it is secretly back up and running at full power, it's also not really of a threat. You can understand that, like, if Goku and Vegeta were here, they would solve this problem within a matter of minutes. You know what I mean? Even Cell Max at the end of the movie, which I'll get to him, and Cell Max is interesting in his own right, and there's some backstory on, like, extra information on how strong Cell Max might be if he ever reached completion. Um, but even with Cell Max as he is in the movie, I think if Goku and Vegeta were there, like Ultra Instinct, Ultra Ego, like this would be no problem, okay? They would be able to wipe out the Red Ribbon Army before breakfast or something, right? Cell Max might give them some trouble, but like not a big deal, you know what I mean? Especially if you throw Broly in the mix. Now, if Cell Max was completed... Because it was revealed in the little pamphlet thing that, like, if Cell Max reached his perfect form, he would be even stronger than Broly! And it's just like, okay, okay, calm down, calm down. That doesn't actually happen in the movie, but alright, it's an interesting piece of lore, I guess. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Hedo, let's talk about him. Dr. Hedo uh, is the grandson of Dr. Jiro. Um, they go into a whole lore thing with that where Carmine is talking about the uh, the family tree of Dr. Jiro, and we actually see it. And once again, this is cool. We see Dr. Jiro, and then we see his wife, uh, Dr. Vomi, who would later become the template for Android 21. Now, now she's from video games. I've never played those video games where Android 21 shows up. I know what she looks like, so I recognized her right away. So that was modeled after Jiro's wife. I did know that Jiro's son was modeled after, was the template for Android 16. The idea is that Dr. Zero had a son who was killed, I think, by Goku when he attacked the Red Ribbon hideout when he was a kid. And so Dr. Zero's son died, and then he made Android 16 based off of his son's appearance. And Jiro's son was named uh, Gevo, okay? Now, they had two sons. They had two children, okay? They had Gevo, and then they had another child who we don't know. They kind of leave that one ambiguous. Like, Dr. Zero and uh, Dr. Vomi had another child that we don't know. And then that child had Dr. Hedo, okay, who is the grandson, who's 24 years old, who's like a fat kind of like otaku kid that goes around to like, you know, anime conventions and like super like comic cons and stuff like that and gets like signatures and things. And he has this like really dorky, because here's the thing with this movie. When I was looking at the promotional images for this movie, like the posters, I'm seeing this guy and I'm looking at this, and I'm just like, oh, this is going to be a goofy movie, isn't it? This is going to be a weird comic relief Dragon Ball movie. Like, this is the villain. Like, come on, guys. He's not the villain. I mean, he is, but he isn't, okay? And honestly, when this guy showed up, like, the way his character was depicted, I was, like, not as annoyed with him as I thought I would be. I was actually kind of invested in in his, like, you know, like, what he's trying to do and everything, because he's, like, a big fan of, like, old school, like, like, Ultraman, Super Sentai, Tokusatsu kind of heroes, okay? So he makes these two new androids called Gamma 1 and Gamma 2 that are made in that style, like that Ultraman kind of style, and they have the outfits, and they have, like, the laser guns and everything like that, and they're really powerful androids. And I'm like, you know what? These are different androids than, like, we're just going to continue the android program. Like, all right, we had Android 17 and 18, and then 19 and 20, and then 21. All right, let's just bring out Android 22, bring out Android 23. At least they look different. They have a different aesthetic. Their personalities are unique. I actually kind of like them by the end of the movie. I kind of wanted them to survive. Well, one of them does. Well, one does. Two doesn't, but one does. Um, so, and I, I, you know what? It was just like, they were literally androids that were built to be like, tokusatsu 1970s era japanese superheroes and they were like they were programmed with that like hero kind of code into their into their brains so they fight for the red ribbon rv who are clearly evil because they're led to believe they're the good guys they come up with this whole thing where Magenta kind of convinces Hedo to work for him by saying that Capsule Corporation is actually an evil, like, shadow organization, right? That uh, aliens are there, and they're, like, trying to take over the world. And um, Hedo believes him because he's a little bit naive, but also, like, he shows him video of Trunks, future Trunks killing Frieza. And that's also an interesting, really cool piece of lore, because that was back when Dr. Giro had that little...
like ladybug robot sentry thing that would like scan so it would make sense why they would have that video footage like where did this video footage come from of future trunks killing frieza that was something that was established in dragon ball z it's great isn't it it's pretty cool and that's also interesting how they were able to extract the dna from frieza for cell that was also explained there okay so um basically they spin it in a way where, like, oh, these aliens are flying in and out of Capsule Corp, you know, Vegeta, Goku, and everybody, and, like, the talk of the town is, like, maybe the Capsule Corporation has been working with extraterrestrial life, and that's how they get the technology for the capsules and everything, and so it, you know what, obviously we know that's not true, but from, like, a, 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 an oblivious perspective, a civilian's perspective, like, Holy crap, that does make kind of sense. And it also makes you begin to question things about the Dragon Ball universe like you've never questioned before. Like, exactly how much knowledge does the general population of Earth know about Saiyans? And know about, like, Goku and Vegeta and Gods of Destruction and Super Saiyan Transformations and Shenron and the Dragon Balls and Kami and Piccolo. Like, how many of the regular citizens of the world, like, know about this? And then you start to think that, like, dude, the Dragon Balls exist. Every time something horrible happens, they usually just probably bring the population of the Earth back and then wipe their memories, which is what happened with Boo. Boo literally exterminated the entire human race. No biggie, not a big deal. You could just use the Dragon Balls to bring them all back. And then it was like, well, yeah, but then they're going to know Boo is, like, this dangerous alien that killed them all. It's like, ah, not a big deal. We'll wait a few months, we'll bring Shenron back out, and he'll just wipe all their memories. So then you start to think, like, how many times has that happened in, in the Dragon Ball franchise? Like, oh my god, there was this giant battle that left a huge crater the size of freaking Malaysia in the, in the size of the freaking island or whatever. And just like, what are we going to do with that? It's like, it's okay, it's okay. We'll wait for Shenron, and then he'll fix the crater, and then we'll also... um will also wipe everybody's memory so they don't remember the horrible, like, attack and travesty that occurred. They've probably done that so many times, so the regular people on the planet Earth have no idea what's going on with Goku and Vegeta, and they're, they're Saiyans? What? You know, they probably just wipe all their minds. Maybe not every single one of them, you know, there's like a few people out there that, like, remember, but, like, you know, the general population is probably like, eh, whatever, I saw some people flying over into Capsule Corporation the other day, and whatever. Every time Shenron pops out in the middle of the city, it's always just like, eh, that Dr. Brief with his science making a giant holographic dragon again, you know? So, yeah, I mean, you could kind of spin it, like, you know, if it's to a complete person that doesn't understand anything about, like, Saiyans or anything. Yeah, Capsule Corporation is evil, and it's like, all right, cool. So, uh, Dr. Hedo starts working for the Red Ribbon Army. He makes Gamma 1 and Gamma 2 as, like, his main projects, as, like, his androids that he loves, because he's obsessed with, like, you know, superheroes and things, right? And so then, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Jero... And so then Magenta is also like, okay, we, I want you to bring back Cell. We have all the information, we have all the, the notes and the research that Dr. Giro did with Cell, but we have nobody that's able to decipher it because, you know, nobody's a scientist here, okay? But Dr. Harrow can. And so he's like, okay, I'm going to, uh, you know, analyze the data. And he's like, good, I want you to make Cell Max. And Dr. Hedo is like, I really don't want to do that because... Cell is, like, this horrible monster that, like, almost wiped out the entire planet. Like, he, why would he want to do that? So, I gotta be honest with you. At the end of the movie, when Cell Max finally wakes up in Christmas fashion, he's got red and green as his style now. Um, he, he is just this screaming, just powerhouse of just no personality. Okay? But I'll be, I'll be honest with you. In this situation, it actually kind of works. It works because... Dr. Hedo did not want to make this thing, okay? And he's like, I, you know, he's also like, I have his body, but I don't have, like, like a personality or a mind for him. He's just a raging berserker. He's not finished yet, you know what I mean? Once he's finished, he would be the greatest, you know, being ever, but, like, he's not done yet. And then Magenta's an idiot and is just like, come on, I'm bored. I want the damn thing to be active already. I don't want to wait. Once again, something that, you know, a Commander Red would definitely do. So, um, there's also a major weak point that Dr. Hedo installed. Like, if you just hit Cell Max's, uh, skull enough, 
he'll explode. And it's like, okay, that's an obvious weak point, but once again, it makes sense in the context because Dr. Hedo did not want to make the damn thing. And he's like, I'm going to make this horrible murder machine that could wipe out the entire planet. I'm going to install a failsafe on the damn thing, though. Just hit his noggin hard enough, and then he'll explode. I'm like, okay, cool, great. So anyway, that's the backstory. That's the lead-up, okay? And then we focus on Piccolo. Piccolo is training Pan, Goku's granddaughter, Gohan's, uh, you know, daughter, in order to be just a warrior. She's, she hasn't learned how to fly yet. She's only three and a half years old. Uh, she wants to learn how to fire key attacks and everything, but Piccolo's like, you know, you have to wait until you master the fundamentals and all that stuff. And uh, this brings us to the first kind of major issue with this movie. Um, there is a time skip here, okay? So Pan is three and a half years old. I don't know exactly the time frame of where we were at during the Tournament of Power, but I remember in the anime, yeah, you know, Pan was still a baby. And if you're talking about the manga, you know, going into, like, the Moro arc and then the Granola arc, which we just finished up, like, I have no idea how much time is passing, but it's been, like, several years. Like, if we're going with the timeline here, this movie, Superhero, takes place years after the Granola arc, which we just finished. Like, literally the last chapter of the Granola arc was in the manga, just, like, like last week it got released, okay? That's, so we're moving on to a new arc in the Super Manga. There's actually going to be a little bit of a hiatus for a little while. But, um, yeah, so I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, okay, so what's the deal with, like, Goku and Vegeta then? You know, because they would have, their, they would have like, like, Goku should have mastered Ultra Instinct at this point. Vegeta should have Ultra Ego at this point. And it's like, that's kind of a cool thing where they're not really in the movie, so we don't really see it, but it also makes sense why they're not in the movie that much, because that way we don't have to worry about this, okay? And also, when this movie was made, when it was originally being written, and animated and everything, they had no idea what was going to happen in the manga because those chapters hadn't come out yet, all right? So Goku and Vegeta, I'll just tell you what they do in the movie because it doesn't take very long. Um, they're training on Whis's planet, not Whis's planet, Beerus's planet, but it's Whis's planet. And uh, Broly's there, Chi Lai's there, Lemon is there from the previous movie from Broly. And um, they have a, like a battle, like a competition where Whis is like, Okay, Goku and Vegeta, I want you to spar and fight, and we're going to watch. However, no transformations are allowed, no energy attacks are allowed, uh, no transformations of any kind, just an all-out base form slugfest. You could still fly, but that's it. You're not allowed to fire any energy attacks, you're not allowed to transform. So that's a beautiful way of showing that, and it honestly, we see Goku and Vegeta fighting just in, like, just with regular martial arts, like punches, kicks, grabs, locks, you know, throwing around. That's all we see, and I'll be honest with you, it was a good moment. It was, an, it was a highlight of the film, because that's all we really get from them. But it's like, dude, we're so conditioned with Dragon Ball to be like, you know, energy attack, bigger energy attack, even bigger energy attack, different color energy attack. Those are cool. But remember what Dragon Ball was at the very beginning. It was a martial arts kind of style. Yes, there were key attacks from the beginning. You know, Master Roshi busts out the Kamehameha like in the first few chapters of the series. There were always key attacks in Dragon Ball. But there was definitely more of a focus on martial arts and stuff in the beginning. And that sort of just fell away at a certain point, you know, in favor of like bigger transformations, spikier hair. And I'm not saying one or the other. You can have both. You can have a martial arts movie and also crazy transformation key attacks. And they do that beautifully in this film, okay? So there's cool martial arts moments in the 3D perspective. That works. And then at the end, you also have some really cool transformations. Like Gohan has a new transformation. Beast Gohan. That was all over the, you know, all over social media. Piccolo has actually technically two transformations, but really only one that really looks different. Um... So yeah, so that's that's Goku and Vegeta. That's what they do. They don't transform. We assume they do have those forms, but they just they can't because that's not what the fight is about. It's just a base form slugfest, and that's something we really don't get to see that often. And then there's a post credit scene that goes back to them where we see the conclusion of their battle, and I'll get to that at the very end because that was really fun. All right, so let's talk about Piccolo, all right? 
So with Goku and Vegeta gone, uh, Piccolo's training Pan. She runs off to, to preschool or whatever. And then Videl calls up Piccolo on his little phone that he has in his house. Piccolo has a house. He has a phone. It's adorable. And Videl's like, hey, can you pick up Pan later? You know, Gohan's busy. I'm busy. Sorry. And then Piccolo is just like, what's Gohan doing? So he goes to visit Gohan at his, like, uh, university or wherever he's working or living or whatever. And he's a biologist and he's a scholar and he's working on, like, some... actually. So in the English dub, they do a pun with this. In the original Japanese, he just talks about like, oh, there's this species of ant that transforms gold. It's like a Super Saiyan, isn't it, Piccolo? In the in the Funimation dub, they have a pun where it's like, it's like a Super Say ant. And I'm like, that's great, though. That's funny. I don't care. Like, it's like humor like that. It's just like they hit me with the Super Saiyan pun. I'm like, I laughed at that because that shit's funny. I'm sorry. I find that lame shit funny. I love puns. I will never not find. I love One Piece, for God's sake. If you like One Piece in any capacity, you have to have an affinity for puns. OK, that's like 50 percent of what Oda writes, for God's sake, is a damn pun. OK, anyway, so I like that moment. Um, one thing that I did not like about the movie, though, is that this is, like, the third time in the story we've had to deal with, like, Gohan has lost his fighting mojo. Now he has to get it back. We've done this so many times in the franchise, and I get Gohan's character. Gohan does not like to fight. That is the premise of his character. He does not want to fight. He does not want to be the strongest in the universe. He wants to be happy with his wife and his child and just be a scholar and a professor and work on this shit. This is what he likes to do. I get it. I'm just saying that we had this moment where he achieved, uh, I don't know what the official term of this form is. I've always called it Mystic Gohan. The form that he takes when the, the Elder Kai, you know, transforms him when during his fight with Boo, okay? Which I'm still salty about to this day that, you know, Gohan was not the one to kill Boo. It had to be Goku. It had to be once again, like, oh, well, Gohan can't do it, even though he had this massive power. It has to be Goku. Bring him back. Like, I'm still mad about that. But we had Mystic Gohan there. And then years go by and he just forgets to, like, like I have this ultimate form. Mystic Gohan. My true potential unlocked. You know, cut to, like, five, six years later. He's like, nah, I don't really know how to do that anymore. Yeah, I, I think I could maybe still go Super Saiyan if I wanted to, but... Like, eh, I get it. I do, Gohan. You're, you're not a fighter. But it's like, maybe you should keep up with the magical, mystical transformation you have achieved in case something were to happen to the planet. And Piccolo even brings that up to him. Piccolo has had enough of Gohan's bullshit. And he's like, what happens if another world-destroying threat comes here? Gohan's reaction is literally, why should I worry about that? Goku and Vegeta are here. And Piccolo's looking at him like, you naive son of a... <laughs> it's like, what are what is wrong with you? What happens if an alien shows up and tries to kill Videl? Are you just going to be like, Dad, help! You know, like... like, And, and you know, like, Gohan does still have, like, reflexes and shit. But when it comes to, like, going into, like, his mystic form and stuff, it's just like, yeah, I really don't know how to do that anymore. It's like, come on! Like, and so my point is, we already did this in Super. We already did the moment where I don't know if Gohan will be able to fight in the Tournament of Power. And so then they have that moment where it's Piccolo and Gohan and Goku and uh, Tien fighting on that plateau. And then so that's where, you know, through Piccolo's training again, you know, Gohan revisits the mystic form. He finally relearns how to unlock that power that the Elder Kai gave him. So this was in the Tournament of Power. This was only like three, not even three years ago, maybe... Excuse me, maybe three years ago. If you want to say Pan was like six months old, because she was still a baby when the Tournament of Power happened. So if you want to say Pan, there's, there's no three and a half in this movie, so like three years has gone by. So it's literally, this is Gohan's character development in the Dragon Ball franchise. I'm just going to bear with this here, okay? So let, let's just start when he goes Super Saiyan 2 and he kills Cell, okay? He goes Super Saiyan 2, kills the shit out of Cell. Then Goku dies, and then he's like, okay, 
I'm just going to be a regular high school student now. I could still go Super Saiyan. I could still do all of that. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm really not focused on fighting too much. I'm going to be the great Saiyan man. It's like, okay, fine, whatever. All right. And then the Boo arc happens, and he's like, I need to unlock my true power. And he does, and he becomes Mystic Gohan. And he's like, I'm going to kick the shit out of Boo. And then he, he messes it up. He screws it up. He drops the ball and the Potara earring. By the way, he drops a he drops a damn uh, Sensu Bean in this. I... I gotta bring up a meme here, just really quick. I saw a meme the other day that made me laugh so hard. It was, remember the scene in Dragon Ball, in, in uh, the Great Saiyan Man arc, when Gohan is in high school, and there was the scene where they're playing baseball, and, like, they hit the ball, and it's like a home run, but Gohan can just fly up and grab the ball, and he's, like, grabbing the ball like it's not a big deal. And then you cut to the end of the Boo Saga, which is, like, the same time as the Great Saiyan Man is happening. It's only, like, a couple of days later, and he can't grab the damn Potara, and he can't grab the Sensu, and just like, when did Gohan's eyesight start to go? It must have been right between those moments. That's the definitive moment. I guess when he unlocked, when the Elder Kai unlocked his mystic form, that's when Gohan's eyesight just got shot to shit. You know what I mean? Like, okay. Anyway, so after that, though, after, after he uh, fails to kill Boo, and, you know, he has to be brought back or whatever, He's just like, okay, yeah, um, Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan 2, Mystic Form, I'm just not even gonna bother with any of that anymore, I'm done, I'm just gonna get married to Videl, and I'm just gonna have a happy life, and I'm gonna have a baby, and it's gonna be great, okay. And then the Tournament of Power happens, where it's like, the literal universe is at the brink of being destroyed, unless we win this tournament, Gohan, get your shit together, and Gohan's like, okay, I'll try to get my shit together. And then he does. He gets his shit together and, you know, Piccolo trains him and he unlocks Mystic again. And it's like, good, awesome. Then the tournament of power is over. Team 7 wins. 17 brings back all the dimensions with his wish. Oh, that's great. And then immediately after the tournament's over, what, does Gohan just go back home and is just like, whew, that was crazy. Oh, well, time to forget how to use Mystic again. It's just like, <laughs> Gohan, 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 bro, bro. Like, this shit's gonna keep happening. It sucks. It sucks that you have to fight every once in a while. I get it. But, like, you know, honestly, in Dragon Ball Z Abridged, they did it the best. Where Android 16 was just like, Gohan, grow up. You're gonna probably have to fight in your life. It's probably gonna be an inevitability. Keep up with this shit, alright? So I swear to God, I swear to God, Gohan gets his new transformation. He gets his Gohan beast form at the end of this. His hair goes silver. It, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like Super Saiyan 3 hair, but like straight up, okay? His eyes go red and he's like, <laughs> channeling the beast within. And it's like, I swear to God, in the next Dragon Ball movie, if it's like, Gohan, use your beast form. And Gohan's like, ah, I haven't used that in like, Two years, man. I have no idea how to go into that again. I'm like, there's only so many times you can pull that, all right? So you're at your, you've already kind of passed that limit, you know what I mean? So anyway, uh, basically, then it's up to Piccolo, okay? So uh, Piccolo has a fight with uh, Gamma number two. Gamma number two is very powerful, manages to kind of uh, suppress Piccolo. And so Piccolo is like, okay, it's up to him. Now he calls Bulma to be like, hey, you need to contact Whis. You need to get Goku and Vegeta back here. The Red Ribbon Army is back up and running. They have a new cell. There's this cool scene where Piccolo like sneaks into the Red Ribbon Army base and they're kind of inept so he can get away with it. He's disguising himself and there's some humor involved in this. It's really funny. It's kind of just, I can't mention every little moment, but it just made me laugh throughout. So he sneaks in, he learns about the androids, he learns about Dr. Jero's grandson, he learns about Cell Max sleeping in the depths, and, uh, and so he's like, oh shit, we need to get Goku and Vegeta here. And so Bulma's like, okay, um, I have the communicator to get in touch with Whis, I have no idea where it is though, I have to dig around my lab, it's just like, man, okay, fine, whatever. So meantime, Piccolo goes up to the lookout, well, he goes to Corrin's tower to get some Sensu beans, they don't have any, like, okay, from what I understood about this movie, everybody on Earth is insanely underprepared for if another galactic threat were to occur. It's like, Corrin doesn't have any Sensu beans, Bulma doesn't know where she keeps the communicator to Whis to summon Goku and Vegeta if they were to be needed. It's like, man, it's like, you guys... Piccolo is, like, the only competent human being. Gohan's not keeping up with his forms. It's like, like, Piccolo, it really is up to him to save the day. And thank God he exists, because otherwise we would have been so screwed. Okay? Trunks and Goten forget how to do fusion. 
Like, I'm, I'm not even kidding. That's a plot point. Like, we'll get to that, though. We'll get to that. All right. So he go Piccolo goes to Corrin's tower, and he's like, I need some sensu beans. And we're like, we only have two. I'm like, just two. Like, yeah, slow harvest this year. I'm like... Go, uh, Piccolo's like, okay, give me the freaking sensu beans, I guess. Then he goes up to Kami's lookout to meet Dende, and Piccolo has an idea. He's like, oh shit, hey, remember how um, Guru, the great elder, was able to unlock the potential of K Krillin and Gohan back in the day? And Dende's like, yeah. He's like, okay, well, you're from the Dragon Clan, so you should be able to do that too. And we get some more lore here. Dende's like, well, I would love to do that, Piccolo, but the problem is we only unlock that ability to awaken others' potential when we reach a certain age. So that's cool. It's like it's like if a Namekian lives for a thousand years, they unlock this potential unlocking ability, you know? That's some cool lore. I like that. But Dende's like, well, wait, hold on. Not a big deal because I can't do it, but we can just summon Shenron, and then Shenron can do it. And he has to upgrade Shenron. He takes out the Shenron statue, another holdover from Dragon Ball. It's always cool to see that thing. And he, like, pours some sacred water on it, and he's like, okay, Shenron is, updated, is upgraded now. He's got 4K Ultra HD. You know, he's like, he's updated now. So it's like, okay, okay, cool, cool. But how are we going to, you know, assembling all the Dragon Balls really quick? That's going to take forever. So <laughs> this leads into, um, oh, my God. I, I, I can see a lot of people being split on this. I actually think it makes sense. I actually think it does. Okay. So Dende explains, well, Bulma actually has been collecting the Dragon Balls as soon as they've been active. And then she makes her wishes immediately and then they separate and go back into stone, and as soon as they're made active again, she immediately goes out and collects them. She has, like, robots and stuff that goes do that. She has, like, a whole Dragon Ball collection agency as part of Capsule Corp, wh whose sole job it is is to scour the world and find the Dragon Balls as soon as they become active, bring them back to Capsule Corp, summon Shenron immediately, make the three wishes, and then they go back. Now, you might be thinking why she would be doing this. And she's been doing this for, like, several years. The last time skip she's been doing this. You actually have to think about this, okay? And they even reference back from, like, Broly and then Resurrection of F, okay? If we just leave the Dragon Balls out in the wild, unattended, while they're active, what happens if another group gathers them up and summons the dragon? That's how we get Frieza's resurrected. You know, that's not good. So it's like, okay... But we also can't just gather all the Dragon Balls and keep them in a Capsule Corp while they're active because same kind of problem. Then all somebody has to do is just break into Capsule Corp, steal all the balls at once, and then boom, they get a free wish. So Bulma's new tactic, she went a completely different direction with this. Bulma's new direction with this is like, okay, we're just going to collect them as soon as they're active, make the wishes, and then they go back to being inactive, okay? We're just going to keep the balls as inert as humanly possible as long as possible. Now, there are some downsides with this. Like, for example, what happens if Bulma makes a wish and then, like, a month later, freaking Krillin dies for the third time? And it's like, oh, no, Krillin's dead. It's like, well, sorry, I just made a wish last month, so we're going to have to wait 11 months to bring him back. I mean, like, bringing people back from the dead is not really that big of a deal. It's never been that big of a deal in Dragon Ball. You know, you have the Namekian Dragon Balls now. Whis can kind of just do it with a flick of his wand, you know what I mean? So it's like, eh. But I'll be honest with you, this new tactic, there are some downsides to it. But considering how, like, every time someone sneaks on the planet Earth and steals the Dragon Balls when they're just out in the wild, this is a logical way, I guess, to try. At least they're trying something new, okay? It might not be that effective, but at least they're like, all right, that didn't work. Plan B didn't work. Let's try Plan C and see if that works. Okay. Now, what exactly has Bulma been wishing for, though? If she just collects these Dragon Balls and makes three wishes and then separates and then collects them again, makes three more wishes. She's been doing this for, like, the last three years. She's gotten, like, nine or ten wishes. Like, what is she been wishing for she's a freaking billionaire you know what i mean so piccolo's like whatever it doesn't matter she has the balls so i'm gonna go and just summon shenron so piccolo travels to capsule corp bulma's there piccolo summons shenron it's a really cool scene when shenron is summoned because he's like i am the eternal Dr oh hey what's up kami <laughs> and piccolo's like yeah i'm not kami anymore but it's cool hey nice to see you shenron how you been oh not much just chilling out so it's like yeah dende is the new guardian of earth dende is the new god but kami used to be god so it's cool that like shenron and piccolo are kind of like it's like hey it's like rio like old bar buddies they haven't seen in a while or something so i really like that scene that was really cool like little things like that it's 
sprinkled throughout the movie just made my day. So then Piccolo makes his wish to Shenron. He wishes to have his potential unlocked, okay? And so he's like, oh yeah, no problem. And so he unlocks Piccolo's uh, true form, his like true potential. But he also like, I threw in something extra for you too, you know? And so Piccolo has his new form, his first form, which is just like his body gets a little bit bulkier and he turns like a slightly yellow green shade. And that's it. And you can kind of see it here, and it's like not really all that different, okay? But that's something extra that Shenron gave him. He does have another form, and the other form looks so cool. And it's finally an upgrade that Piccolo sorely needed, okay? Because Piccolo always gets screwed over when it comes to transformations, because he doesn't have any, right? Like, he fuses with Nail, he looks the same. He fuses with Kami back to his original form, he looks the same. You know what I mean? Like, he doesn't have any extra form. Let me tell you a story really quick. When I was a little kid, I had a friend named Ian, and me and him always used to watch Dragon Ball growing up. We would, like, do the Kamehamehas. Like, you all had a friend growing up that you watched Dragon Ball Z with in the 90s, okay? That's just how it worked, okay? Anyway, one day, I remember watching the episode where Kami uh, fuses with Piccolo, and I'm like, oh my god, Piccolo is a super Namekian now! And I went down to Ian's house, and I'm like, Ian, you'll never believe it, what happened? Piccolo fuses with Kami, and he becomes a super Namekian! And Ian didn't believe me, he was like, Pfft can't become a super Namekian. What's he going to do, Matt? Grow hair and then the hair grows yellow? And I'm like, no, that's a Super Saiyan. Super Namekians are different. And he just didn't believe me. So screw it. Piccolo is a Super Namekian in this movie. He's an Ultra Namekian. Damn straight. Okay. So he makes the wish. Shenron unlocks his potential. And then Piccolo, he looks over to Bulma and he's like, all right, well, I guess you get the two remaining wishes. Why not? Okay. And so we finally find out what Bulma has been wishing for. Okay. I'm just going to say it's a really good thing GT's not canon. <laughs> because if GT was canon and all the shit with the Black Star Dragons was true, was like actual canon. Because remember, the Black Star Dragons are whenever a wish is made selfishly, it creates negative energy in the balls, and then that creates the shadow dragons, born out of the negative energy, the selfishness of the wishes that were made. All I have to say is I'm really glad that's not canon, because if that was true, Bulma alone would have been responsible for, like, four of the shadow dragons, okay? <laughs> like, all right. She's wishing for literal cosmetic surgery. She literally is like, hmm, my butt is like sagging a little bit. Could you make it something like, you know, like I'm in my early 20s, you know, something like that. And Shenron's like, it is granted. Your buns have been restored. And it's like, okay. And then she's like, my second wish, I actually want my eyelashes to be like two millimeters longer. And then Shenron's like, okay, your wish has been granted. And then Piccolo's like, Really? Really, though? That's what you've been using them for? And Bulma's like, hey, I mean, the alternative is like, the alternative, okay, is like, what if Freeze's group grabs the balls again, or some other evil group like the Red, what if the Red Ribbon Army got their hands on the damn things, you know what I mean? So, if the Shadow Dragons are not an issue, and Dende seems to not have a problem with it, Dende is not like, Piccolo, you need to have a conversation with Bulma, okay? The way she's been using the Dragon Balls is just so in an abuse of their power. No, Dende seems to not give a shit. Dende actually seems kind of happy about it. He's just like, yeah, she's been collecting the Dragon Balls and making wishes. Ha ha ha, that's Bulma. So it's like, like I said, if there's no negative consequences and it's keeping the Dragon Balls out of the hands of evildoers, fine, let her get uh, the butt lift or the, you know, get some wrinkles removed, get some skin tags clipped off. Who cares? Whatever. Some people were upset about that. I found it as just like, all right, that's what Bulma would use the Dragon Balls for. Like I said, there's still a problem because what would have, like, what would have happened if Gohan were to have died in this battle? with uh cell max like let's say gohan just dies or what if pan died and it's like i'm sorry i can't use the dragon balls to wish pan back to life because i needed to get a boob job last month so sorry you know like there's a problem with that still but hey i, I guess like they're gonna go with it and see how well it works out i i guess okay but nobody died nobody died well okay gamma number two died so i guess they could have used the dragon balls to bring him back um, but, you know, they could still do that, you know, it's just like wait a year and they can bring him back, you know, sure, why not? Yeah, I don't think Gamma 2 is ever going to reappear in this series, which is a shame because I kind of like them. 
So anyway, Piccolo's got his new form, so he just charges right into Red Ribbon Army HQ, and, uh, oh wait, no, wait, no, I have to talk about the other scene where they pick Pan up for the preschool, that's hilarious. So Piccolo is teamed up with, like, this generic, uh, Red Ribbon Army grunt, like this big muscle dude. So, he looks like, like, like Arnold, he looks like the Terminator, basically, just like, I'm a big tough guy and I work for the Red Ribbon Army. Alright, you grunt, let's go and kidnap Gohan's daughter so we can use her as leverage, let's do it. It's so... You know, where it's like they're in the ship together and they're traveling down and they're like in the middle of broad daylight just like looking at like uh, Pan getting out of preschool like, all right, let's go do this. And then Piccolo's like, uh, hold on. Pan just decks this buff guy out, just like hits him with one punch and he falls to the ground. And then Piccolo walks over and then Pan instantly knows it's Piccolo because of his energy. And the, it's so funny. You have the, uh, the preschool teacher there and Piccolo's like, yeah, sorry, Janet. This guy is just a problem. Problem. We're gonna get going now. It's just this weird like slice of life like family scene that Piccolo just now lives Anyway, so they go back to the Red Ribbon Army HQ uh, Piccolo in his first form like the yellow green form fights against Gamma number two and it's very clear that he's not going to be able to beat him. Um, uh, Gohan is also there at this point to come rescue Pan. It just basically devolves into a huge fight, okay? It starts to rain. Gohan's there. He gets pissed that Pan has been kidnapped. He goes Super Saiyan. He's really badass. He starts fighting the Gammas. And then Piccolo uh, gets beaten down. And then he goes into his new form, his orange form, all right? And the, the way that he transforms is incredible. He gets knocked down this giant shaft. And then as he's falling, like Shenron appears in his mind and this cool symbol like appears on uh, Piccolo's back in the form of a tree and it lights up and Piccolo's just like oh and then like this giant pillar of like orange energy just erupts out of the earth and then Piccolo just he doesn't fly out he floats out just like oh hey ho like Lucifer rising from the ninth circle of hell just he's just bathed in orange flames his body's bulked up like the Hulk he is like the orange Hulk basically just like ironic considering the Hulk is green and Piccolo is normally green just not in this instance okay so Piccolo emerges out of the out of the out of the void and he's super buff and he's like orange Piccolo and he beats the crap out of he punches out freaking uh, Gamma 2 knocks him down and then that fight is kind of over at that point okay and then Gohan is also victorious against one he goes back into Mystic with his daughter being you know at, at risk of being killed so then Gohan goes back into Mystic and it's like okay he can still go into that form if enough pressure is applied all right so we think everything is co is copacetic for right now, right? Like, okay, uh, Magenta fights against Hedo, and Hedo has, like, this little bee that, like, injects poison into him that kills him, but not before he pushes the button to activate Cell Max, of course, because every evil scientist lab has to have just, just push this button and just, like, typing in password. Why would Dr. Hedo tell like uh, magenta how to activate cell max like why would that even be a thing like he would not tell him and be like he's like yeah here's the password if you want to unlock this evil monstrosity that could wipe out the planet so um there's a little bit of a rest time where piccolo is there gohan is there gamma one and gamma two are now on their side bulma shows up with 18 and krillin uh go tank go not go tanks uh go ten and trunks show up and they're like hey guys we're here you know and and there's a there's a funny scene where bulma's like i've assembled the earth's mightiest heroes and krillin and it's like okay that was kind of a cheap shot on krillin but i'm sure he's he's used to it at this point so they're there all, like, thinking everything is done now, everything's gonna be okay, and then Cell Max wakes the fuck up. And Cell Max, like I said, he doesn't have a personality, he just is a monstrosity of just mad rage. But I'll tell you what, when he's in this tank, and the tank ruptures, and he wakes up, and it's just this... It's like the Tyrannosaurus Rex, like, awakening at Jurassic Park, okay? It's like this giant roar, like, he's not... He's just a natural disaster, and that's all he is. He's like the size of a 10-story building. He has the form of a semi-perfect cell. So the idea is if, and Dr. Hedo even says, like, he has the body of cell, but he doesn't have a mind yet. If he would have become perfected, if he would have became perfect cell max, which I have a feeling that's going to be a thing. I just have a feeling because you've set that up, like, perfect cell max in the, in the pamphlet, 
perfect cell max is going to make an appearance whether that be in a video game or in like dragon ball like uh heroes or whatever it's called you know there's it's some version of the franchise there's going to be perfect cell max and what he actually looks like and how powerful he is he's like the strongest being even beyond broly you know rivaling even the gods of destruction rivaling even jiren whatever ultra instinct ultra ego he's better than all of that that's probably going to be a thing in the future so let's just expect that, all right? There is a little fun scene, though, I did want to bring up. And it's, um, they do bring up the Gohan glasses thing where Gohan loses his glasses when he was fighting the androids. And he's like, I can't find my glasses, guys. Can you help me? And I think it's Krillin that just says, like, so how does that work, Gohan? Like, when you go Super Saiyan, your eyesight's fixed. But when you go back into your base form, you just, your eyes go back to crap. Like, we don't get an answer to it. But it's one of those things that I'm just happy they reference because you're thinking it. It's like, how come Gohan wears glasses now? He never used to have to wear glasses when he was in high school. He didn't have to wear glasses. Glasses. Why did he just start wearing glasses in like his mid 20s? Does he have like ocular degeneration that only occurs when he's in his base form? I, I don't know, but it's just one little thing they mentioned. I thought I found it funny. So anyway, um, Cell Max wakes up and then it becomes just an all out brawl. So you have Orange Piccolo there who transforms. He can go into the bigger size. Like, you know, Krillin is even like, Piccolo, make yourself bigger. Like when you fought Goku at the World Martial Arts Tournament. And Piccolo's like, oh yeah, I forgot I could do that. Vroop. You forgot you could do that. Okay. Then we have another scene with Goten and Trunks where Trunks looks over at Goten and is like, hey Goten, we should do fusion. And Goten's like, fusion? What are you talking about? And then Trunks is like, you know, with the dance. And then he's like, oh, right, fusion. Yeah, like that thing we used to do. Ah, oh, man, I barely remember how to do that. Okay. <laughs> so I laughed at those scenes at... But not because they, I mean, they were funny, but for the wrong reasons. They were funny because it's like, yeah, it's been like three years. We used to know this fusion dance to like combine into like this ultimate warrior. And then at the mention of fusion, Goten is like, he mind blanks. And he's just like, what are you talking about? And I'm just like, the dance. Like, oh, the dance. Yeah, okay. It's just like, how do you forget this? Like, you're like, mm. I don't know. I don't know. The only thing, actually, okay. To be fair, Goten and Trunks are like teenagers now. So maybe they were like stoned. Maybe they were like, maybe like, like Goten was just hanging out outside at Mount Palzu and, you know, just like smoking and he's just getting really high. And then he gets a message from Trunks like, hey, Trunks, uh, Cell's about to wake back up. You want to go fight? And Goten's like, yeah, dude, that sounds awesome, bro. And he just tr goes and is like, hey, man, let's fight Cell. Okay, let's do this. And Trunks is like, we should fuse. And Goten's like, fusion? What are you? Oh, yeah, yeah, we should do the fusion. Yeah, that I remember that. That was fun. So they fuse. They mess it up, of course. They mess up the fusion dance. We get fat Gotenks. But you know what? They don't do the thing where they defuse and then go back and it's like, oh, let's try this again. No, fat Gotenks just fights against Cell Max and actually manages to get a decent hit off on the guy. Uh, there's some gags with him where his pants get ripped and his butt crack is hanging out. So just like, oh, man, that sucks, guys. It's like, okay, whatever, I'll take it. Krillin gets a solar flare. 18 does some shit. Um, let's see. But it, it's mostly focused on basically a kaiju fight of giant Cell Max and then giant um, Orange Piccolo, like, grappling the crap. Uh, Gamma number two gives his life to, like, exhaust his power cell and slam into Cell to try to kill him. It doesn't work. He, like, rips off one of his arms. He can't regenerate. Um, and then it basically comes down to, like, Gohan, you got to use your new form. So Gohan unlocks the beast within. He goes into his beast form. This is a cool scene because Cell Max sees him in his new form. And then Cell Max, he has, like, a fist the size of a damn dump truck truck just Whoa! and just goes to punch gohan in his beast form the fist hits him like you know this is like this is gohan the fist is like Whoa! and it doesn't gohan doesn't even raise up an arm to catch it he doesn't block it it's just like a, a, a like i said a mac truck sized fist just just hits his body but he's just like unmovable it's like is that all you got 
Okay, then. And then he finishes him off. Uh, Piccolo uses his stretchy arms, something else that he just remembered he had, I guess. Manages to grapple Cell Max long enough for Gohan to charge up a Makan Ko Zappo, a special beam cannon. Fire the shot straight at Cell Max. Hits his head. He dies. He detonates because that's how he was programmed to work. Whatever. He blows up in a giant crater. Takes out, like, the entire continent. But it's okay. Dragon Balls, we could just fix that in, like, a year or whatever. And then that's the end of the movie. Pan has a little bit of an arc where she learns how to fly. And it's like, Pan, the world's exploding. You need to learn how to fly. And then Pan flew. And it's like, yeah! Okay, cool. And then, um... At the end of the movie, before the credits roll, everybody's just together again. Piccolo and Gohan have their new transformations. Pan flies around, and Piccolo's like, I'm proud of you. You know, we'll begin your new training tomorrow. And Pan's like, yay! And then roll credits, and it's like... Okay, Dr. Hedo is alive, he's going to work for Capsule Corp, and Gamma Number 1 is going to work as a security officer. I, I kind of want to see these characters again, it's just so strange. I did not think I was going to give a shit about any of the, the side characters or the villains in this story, but I did. So I kind of want to see Gamma 1 again, like as a security officer at Capsule Corp. I I'd like to see him again, yeah, sure. So, credits roll. Post credit scene, we cut back to Weiss's planet. I keep saying Weiss's planet. It's Beerus's planet. We cut back to Beerus's planet. Oh, by the way, Beerus has a crush on Chi-Li. I forgot to bring that up, but he's just he has the hots for Chi-Li now. The the lady from the Frieza Force that we were, everybody was shipping with Broly. Well, Broly, you got some competition. I'm just saying now, okay? But whatever. That's a little funny scene with that. And then um, we just have the end of the fight between Vegeta and Goku. Now, they've been fighting for, like, I want to say, like, at least, like, 12 hours. Okay, just a fisticuffs, just... Ugh. Ugh. They, like, exhausted all of their energy, everything they have. And then finally, it's like the post credit sequence, last punch, Vegeta's like... Ugh. Goku goes down, and Vegeta's like... I did it! <laughs> I finally beat Kakarot! And then, but everybody's asleep. Like, Whis and Beerus and Sheila and Lemon, they're all like, oh, um, oh, yeah, they did it. No, actually, no, Lemon is still awake and Broly is still awake. Broly and Lemon are just weeping. They just, the camera cuts over to them weeping. Like, that was the most beautiful display of fighting I've ever seen in my life. And then Goku's on the ground and he's like, ah. Uh, and then Vegeta collapses, and then that's the end of the movie. Vegeta finally beat Goku. In a base form fisticuffs brawl, he won. Now you could still like, well, what would happen if it, they were at full power? Ultra Instinct, Ultra Ego, whatever. Doesn't matter. Vegeta got a win. Do not take this away from him, okay? Do not take this away from him, all right? He has this, all right? He's going to go home, and he's going to make a statue or a plaque or something that's going to be like, this day in the year 792 or whatever year it is in the Dragon Ball universe, I finally defeated Kakarot, you know? He has a win, all right? That's the movie. Huh, so that was an over an hour. Wow, that was crazy. But, you know, dude, I... I love this. I really did. I would recommend this movie. I don't know if, like, I'm thinking about how to rate it compared to the other recent Dragon Ball movies, like the, at least the last three that came out, so out of the four that have been since Battle of Gods. And um, I don't think it's really fair to compare this movie to, like, Resurrection F, Battle of Gods, in terms of, like, battles, plot, because it's very different. Um, if you want to compare them, in, even in terms of animation, it's just a different kind of animation style altogether. You know what I mean? Like, the animation in Resurrection of F kind of sucked every now and then. Uh, there was really bad CG in Resurrection of F. There's really good CG here, so yeah. So, in terms of animation, I think it's one of the best ones, honestly. I, I want to see... I want to see... Now that we did a movie like this... I want to see other movies, like, in the same kind of format and the same kind of style. But we can also do, like, a Dragon Ball, like, a serious Dragon Ball movie with Goku and Vegeta in this 3D fashion. I would love to see Ultra Instinct in this animation style. Like, I think it would look really cool, you know? Um, Freeze is not even mentioned at all in the movie, which is important to mention because 
uh, what's going on with him right now in the manga is a whole other... I'm not going to bring that up right now, but you know, there's some big stuff going on in the Dragon Ball manga if you haven't been reading it lately. So go and check that out. Um, but yeah, that was uh, my discussion, review, whatever you want to call this, on Dragon Ball Super. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it way more than I thought I would. Um, I would say, like I said, like if you're going into this expecting Goku, Vegeta, Brawl Fest, or like Broly 2 or whatever, like that's not going to be it. Uh, it. It's definitely more lighthearted. It's definitely more comedy. But if you're a fan of, like, the old-school Dragon Ball, like, if you grew up with Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z back in the 90s, like I did, um, you'll enjoy this. You'll enjoy this. The updated animation, the focus on Go Gohan and Piccolo, um, you know, it's fun. It's, it's, it's a fun movie. I had fun watching this Dragon Ball movie. Okay. So with that all being said, I guess I'll see you back here when the Dragon Ball Super anime comes back at some point. Teching, signing out. Later.